welcome to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, where we discuss e-commerce issues and whether our guest today automated, delegated, or eliminated them and why. Your host is Will Christensen, co-founder of Data Automation. And again, welcome to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate. Welcome everybody to this episode of Automate, Delegate, Eliminate. Uh, this season, we are exploring the founding stories of companies large and small who have influenced um, automation, delegation, and elimination in a big way. Very excited today to introduce Jeremy Ring. Jeremy was hired as a director of sales at Yahoo back in 1996 by legendary founder Jerry Yang. After a profanity-laced telephone call with Jerry, Jeremy quit his current job after only one day of being with that company to begin a five and a half year journey at Yahoo. This would change his life. Since leaving Yahoo, Jeremy has been a successful entrepreneur, a Florida state senator, and ran for CFO of Florida in 2018. He has also been a champion for students with students uh, united with parents and educators to resolve bullying. Superb, the superb program. Jeremy is here with us today to talk about the rise and fall of Yahoo from the, his 50-yard line view. So, I mean, honestly, I couldn't be more excited about our, our, our interview today, and, and I want to hear more about what that was like. So what it was like, um, so I, I I was fortunate. I was actually, um, I joined the company, well, they, they, they incorporated about a year after they were actually started their project, and their project was... Um, what I understand, it wasn't so much a project, as it was more a hobby. Where early days of the internet, you know, you had a lot of websites popping up, and there was no way to really kind of create a directory. So they created a directory, not a search engine. They actually reviewed every website and placed them into different categories. It was kind of the, I guess, the Dewey Decimal System for online behavior, if you want to call it, kind of a library. Um, and so as it grew, you know, is it, is it really took off immediately um and i mean that train was going fast so i was at an advertising agency in new york i mean that's only 25 years ago now 26 years ago i think and my client was a big telecom company at the time called mci remember them they're all in jail now pretty much but okay (laughs) they were they were a big big tech a big telecom company and we put the first ads, I, I guess I bought the first ads ever to appear on Yahoo, remember those banner ads? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. kind of help create what that, you know, ad program would be. So a few months later, I get a uh, call from a company out of Seattle called Starway. Uh, they were actually well known as an early internet startup because they created the site for ESPN. They did ESPN.com. And their, the founder was um, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. They were out of Seattle, and um, so they weren't acting for money. So they called me up, and they'd asked me if I'd open their New York office for them. So I flew out to Seattle, and the first day I was there, Jerry called. He's like, you know, come and work at Yahoo and open our New York office and be our first salesperson. And I was, uh, it was a great opportunity, but I, my first response to Jerry was, but I've only been here for three hours in this company. And we, we were we were all friends. So that night, uh, I went back, and, and he and I and another mentor of mine who was also hired, a gentleman named Neil Singh, who was the worldwide head of sales and marketing for the company. And we struck a deal, and I went in the next morning and quit StarWave after one day and, and started Yahoo the next day in California. And we opened the first East Coast office of Yahoo out of my apartment in New York. So it was super early. <laughs> um, built that office up, uh, moved to California. Um, part of the uh, headquarters office, and you know, we built a we built a company that uh, in five years had a market cap of 120 billion dollars. Completely changed the world. How did it change the world? It changed the way people find information. Mm-hmm. That's that it was that early, and you know, subsequent teams came, and, and we can talk about that. And, and you know, a lot of mistakes were made. Uh, some early on the first team. Um, and some as the later teams. And by the final team, the Marissa Mir era came, it was really too late. The, the company had done enough damage to itself over a 20 year period. Mm. But I, you know, I have a, in my book, I write, I don't think Steve, a combination of Steve Jobs and Abraham Lincoln together could have saved the company. Wow. Um, at that point. But the first five years were pretty magical. So, how did Yahoo differ from its competitors at the time? What made it so profitable? 
you know, early on, we were the first set to shoot with a major brand. That was number one. You know, we did the first internet Super Bowl commercial, which I think made a difference. You know, we were kind of fun and irreverent in a way. What year was that that you did the Super Year Super Bowl commercial? Do you remember? Ninety six or ninety seven. Wow. I don't remember the exact year. And so really early on. But you know, the other companies, they just they couldn't really compete in brand. And why we were you know, we were successful and, and this is I think important to, to keep in mind, um, is that we really believed in creating a profitable company versus just gaining instant wealth. How do we how do we create something that's super profitable? So we had our eye on the ball, but there were even challenges to that. Um, and I can go into great detail on what those challenges were and you know some of the reasons it ended up imploding kind of at the end, first with a dot-com bubble and then, you know, years later, just, you know, pretty much as a company. Well, let before we get into that, let's talk about, you know, at that point that you were hired, obviously, you know, as you mentioned, you know, uh, running that uh, office literally out of your apartment it, in the beginning there, I mean, it was already set up and running, but it sounds like you were still doing some innovating at that time. What did the innovation look like? Or do you feel like at that point they, they weren't innovating? No, we were innovating, but we're innovating for the time. I mean, we were still, you know, in the Atari phase of the internet, right? Mm -hmm. still, you know, we were we were the space invaders and pong of the internet, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you can only do so much innovating, you know, at, at, you know, in the days. I think where we tried to, where we had some success innovating was in the content area. We were kind of the first website to really be streaming news in a, in a broad way. We, you know, broke that out and created a very robust financial service, Yahoo Finance, which actually even today is still one of the, you know, bigger, bigger finance sites, you know, on the internet. We did the same for sports and which is still significant, you know, even today. Uh, they created a, a, a special a service for children called, you know, I think it was called the Hooligans, if I recall it, you know, so. So I think where the innovation really came from was was in in the content side. You know, really aggr the aggregation content um, and that sort of innovation did again it changed the world as well because you know newspapers they didn't they couldn't keep up right and, and they, you know they're the same dinosaur Yahoo is today you know with a, with, with a few exceptions um, they didn't understand the model they just wanted to get you know and in, in, in just incredible breadth of users out there but weren't thinking about how do we make money. Where Yahoo was thinking about how do we take all of this data and aggregate it and send it to the hundreds of millions of users that were using the service, you know, in the US and, and abroad. Interesting. So so Yahoo had the opportunity to acquire Google and passed it up. Couple times. Yeah. Uh, were there any times where in hindsight, you know, when they passed over an opportunity to acquire a business that that you think could have helped, you know, avoid the implosion and some of the other things that, that go there? I think there. it's a hard question to answer. Because of our size and scope, every deal came across our desk, whether it was Google or Apple when when Jobs was gone and they were near bankrupt. I, I don't have proof of it, but I'm, I'm sure Amazon may have come through there at one point. But, but, but every deal came by our desk. And you can look at Google, um, and, and they, Google, had a, a few occasions where it was turned down. Once were for a million dollars, they're worth what, trillion and a half today. But that was, I think, so early on be before they were even named Google. And I'm not sure they even had a name yet. Mm. But uh, at the time, you know, Google was the search engine, purpose of the search engine was to get people off of your site. Yahoo was trying to keep people on its site. Remember the old term portal. The directory. Yeah. yeah. Keep them on, on the site. I think it's, you know, Yahoo not acquiring Google, um, and I don't, I'm sure they weren't the only company that rejected it, because it's just the technology at the time. It wasn't really a business. You know, the world's better, I think, because we have Google. Mm -hmm. Had Yahoo or another company acquired Google, there'd be no Google today. And that's, you know, think about that for a minute. Yeah. Right? It, it wouldn't exist. <laughs> um, Mind-blowing. And so, and I'm not sure Yahoo would have turned it into what it is today, because again, our mission was to keep people on our service, not to send people away. So I think that was, you can look at that. I think the bigger acquisitions that were lost were the second team after I left. Mm. And that those are the stories that I think can will haunt the company forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of them was they had a chance to acquire Facebook and Facebook was building a very significant platform at the time. 
Mm. Uh, if I recall, they it was a little over a billion dollars. Mm. And the CEO at the time, Terry Semel, at the 11th hour and 59th minute, lowered the cost to Mark Zuckerberg, allowing him to essentially walk away. So I think that was that was a you know a, a, a decision made by a non-internet, non-technology accountant person who didn't have a vision. Mm. Uh, and again, I was gone, and the most of the first team was gone by then. The second yeah. time, they did have an opportunity to acquire Google. And they didn't know how to value Google. There was a number there somewhere probably around $5 billion. Um, but again, they couldn't wrap their arms around a valuation, which, and I think I blame, you know, I go back and I blame Terry Semmel, that second CEO. He looked at it with an accountant's eye, because he's an accountant by trade, and not with an eye towards, you know, what is this going to bring us in the future? Mm -hmm. I think those are two significant misses that I, and that I think are worse than Yahoo turning down Google at the very beginning. Right. Even Yahoo and other companies turning down Apple, because if you recall, Apple was near bankrupt and everybody turned Apple down. And, you know, in the years that Jobs wasn't wasn't there. So, you know, there are legitimate reasons why you, why, why you would do that. Now, I do think the biggest mistake the first team made, and this I was in the middle of it, the other ones I wasn't there, is I struggle with to this day, which is what What's the difference between Yahoo and Google? I mean, those are the two biggest questions. The biggest question you're going to ask, you should ask. Why did one succeed and one failed? So Yahoo, because it was first, mm -hmm. you asked about innovation. And while I agree they innovated with content, a magazine, for example, has very strict rules, and they're good rules for a magazine or newspaper, which is you separate advertising and editorial. And those are good rules, and, and we should support those rules. Yahoo followed that rule. Okay, now... Where do you follow that rule? You know, it's content and advertising become much less clean when you're dealing with search. So there was internal battles through the first several years of Yahoo about should we be monetizing search? I was clearly on the side of we need to monetize search, but I was on the revenue side. The product team who had significant power in the company and more power than the sales team had, which is a lesson to be learned, always give your sales team more power than the product team refused to really allow us to monetize search. And it came back, I must have heard a thousand times. It's editorial, it's editorial, it's editorial. So Google comes about, Google says, wait, no, no, no. We have an empty whiteboard. We're gonna create the, our own rules and the rules to play with. And they immediately said, you know what, it's okay. We can, we can monetize search. We can have people pay for search and that search can go to the top of the order. And we can do it without demoralizing the editorial side and without compromising it. So what is Google AdWords today? It's probably a hundred billion dollar business. I can make a case, the greatest margin business in the history of business ever created. Right. And I think more than anything, in my opinion, others may have differing opinions to it, but in my opinion, I see that as the single biggest mistake Yahoo made and the single biggest right move that Google made was the monetization of search. That's fascinating. So the real difference between the two was that one saw themselves as an archaic, I mean, not that our magazines are archaic, but a, a, a one saw themselves as a media company on a screen and the other said, we're not going to play by any rules. We're going to figure out what people really want and we're going to figure out that it's okay to have this section. And it's interesting. I mean, you look at it now and the ads are starting to look more and more like organic search. I mean, they've gotten yeah. rid of the, the yellow box that was behind all of the ads and, yeah. and they, they, they've, they've blurred that line even further. And I think they've gotten better at creating editorial level quality in their advertisements. Like I, I almost find that sometimes the paid advertisements are better results than the, than the editorial that's really fascinating. So so if the lesson to be learned there, if you were to sum it up to other entrepreneurs that are out there in the world today, would it be, you know, don't look at yourself through a lens that someone else hands you? Or what, what would it be? What would be the word of advice you would give for, for that one mistake? Don't, don't be afraid to set new rules. You don't have to, yeah, just don't be afraid to set, to set new rules. Don't be afraid to set new rules. What, what are some things that that business owners or entrepreneurs might be looking at right now where they don't even realize. I mean, because to some degree or another, the product team at Yahoo probably didn't even realize that they were 
following rules that were, that, that were you know what I mean? They, they didn't even realize that they were hampering uh, to, to such a degree. What are some things that entrepreneurs today can do to help them recognize that they may be looking at the world through a lens that isn't the right one? I think there's, there's plenty they can do. I mean, for example, they, they can, how you identify customers, you know, is very different, you know, um, than, than, than it's been in the past. Uh, I think that's one way to look at it. You know, how we identify areas that really need disruption, right? You know, and, 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 and not feel like government's a good example, not so much federal, but mm. state, state and local level. You know, you've got a world that's still on spreadsheets, but on the other hand, you know, you look at it and say, ah, it's really hard to navigate. And, you know, I have a sales cycle and this is going to take me an additional six months, you know, but what you're missing is the ship is at the port right now. And just because it's a longer sales cycle and it's a harder education, you know, it's a $1.5 trillion market. Don't ignore it because your, your short term, it's not going to bring you the numbers you want. Interesting. You know, don't say, okay, well, you know, at this point it's, you know, I, I don't know, it's going to take, it takes forever to break into that market. And that part's true, but if you never start, you'll never get there. Yep. That's fascinating. I mean, you, you talk about the identifying the customers and I guess one way that I would summarize that is identify and know your customer and do not be afraid to test, right? Because had the product team gone out and done a survey of everybody who is using the search engine and actually tested, you know, do, does the use of our search engine decrease when we include ads? If they had actually gone through and done some of that testing, maybe they could have been persuaded to do that, but they weren't even willing to test because they were playing by the rule book that they'd been given. You got to put, you play, you, you just play by rule books and you don't, you just don't always have to do that. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that you can create a path. Now, the one thing which I do think is, consistent across eras is relationships matter then and relationships matters now. And, you know, where's COVID? Is that hurting or helping relationships? You know, we live in an interesting world. We're living in a transformative, transformative world, a disruptive world, because none of us are getting on airplanes to close business anymore. I'm not sure that'll ever come back. Who's going to be at the forefront of that? Who's going to be at the forefront of security, data security in the home now? You know, as an example, um, so, you know, we're, we're, we have, again, we have moments where the ship is in the port, but it's taking off soon. And we want to board that ship now because it's, it's going to take off. And, uh, you know, you, you can say today, okay, I'll be, a, you know, I'm, I'm going to start a, a, a great company, a data migration company, you know, whatever it is. Well, okay, but where were you four years ago? You know, and so, you know, also my other advice is, see the opportunity that's existing. You don't want to get too far ahead, but, you know, witness what's existing and take advantage of the moment. What do they say? Uh, you know, you've heard the term, don't let a good crisis pass you by. Yeah, the good crisis passing you by. It couldn't be more true in terms of COVID-19 and some of the new opportunities that are being created by the crisis. So speaking of crises, you know, uh, or crisis, what, when you were at Yahoo originally, and, I mean, how many, how many individuals were at the company at that point in time? I think when I started, it was like 20, 25, or 25. And when I left, it was about 3000. So, so 20, 25 people, what were some of the difficulties that you faced, uh, at a company of 20, 25? Um, and, and what did you do to overcome them? You know, the, the difficulties weren't internally, weren't that significant in terms of, um, uh, you know, everyone, for the most part, was on the same page. You know, we were all rolling in the same direction, with the exception of that search fight. That was an ongoing debate. There was healthy tension between product and sales that you would probably have in any company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you had to deal with, you know, moving every couple of months because you got so big. But you were still, for the most part, we were we were kind of on the same, you know, rolling in the same direction. From everything I understood, that completely collapsed with the second team. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the whole culture collapsed and everyone was going in different directions. There were nothing but different fiefdoms. Um, and you, you're not going to succeed with a, you know, with a confused, complex poor corp, corporate culture. I think the challenge was external. So, and the challenge was caused by Wall Street. So at the mm -hmm. time we were, 
likely could make a we could make a case we were the highest, if not the highest, amongst the highest profile publicly traded companies in the world, where the microscope was on us. And you have to make your number every quarter. So if you recall, there were companies like eToys and Drugstore.com and I, I don't even remember Pets.com and all these other companies. And they were spending a lot of money on services like Yahoo and supporting our quarterly number. The problem with being a publicly traded company at the time is the bigger, larger brands, the big spenders, the Fords, the Chryslers, the Pepsis, the Procter & Gamble's, were just putting their toe in the water and they weren't going to be rushed. Okay. They just, they just, nothing we could do. They weren't going to be rushed. They were going to test and test and test and test. And it made it very difficult for companies like ours to have long-term mindset, even though those companies had long-term mindsets. Because Wall Street was saying, oh, no, uh, you're, it's quarter to quarter, and you better have more every quarter. So where our, our eye is saying, how am I going to get more money out of Pets.com versus how am I going to get more money out of Ford? Because if because I Ford to, wouldn't move. Ford wouldn't move, or they tow in the water, and they, we spent a lot of time with them. Don't get me wrong. But we couldn't put that so much effort into Ford, right? Because if we did, we would have kept our eyes off of the pets.coms of the world who were the ones spending all the money with us. Interesting. So so because because of Wall Street, your the, the company became focused uh, very narrowly on what was right in front of them instead of what was in the long in the long haul. Yes and no. Yes, we were focused on that and and we absolutely knew that probably wasn't the right long-term strategy we weren't we weren't oblivious to what was going on the problem was wall street didn't allow us to do what we thought we needed to do which was a turn that would have been the right thing to do because if we had taken our eye off the ball on the pets.com and focused entirely on the fords and pepsis or whatever they weren't spending enough money for us to make our quarterly number we knew that and that it wasn't a secret to us it was a frustration more than anything and, and, and so we knew that the dot-com bubble was going to crater. And that, that we knew two years before it happened. And we also knew that Wall Street hadn't allowed us to build up the kind of spending, that, that to work with the companies who were the, ultimately the very big spenders. So, again, not that we didn't know. I want to be clear about it. We got it. We were just completely in very tight handcuffs that made it more difficult for us. Yeah, and I will say this, those companies took a lot of years. I mean, obviously, you know, the world's changed now. Forget about where we are in 2020. But between 1995 and 2000, they would, when I say they had a toe in the water, they had one toe in the water, and maybe the next year they put a second toe in the water. Maybe the next year they put a third toe in the water. It took them years and years to really embrace and and engage the digital world obviously every one of them is there today but it was very slow moving um and you know that's that is oftentimes um you know we forget that they did not in major fortune 500 consumer brands did not embrace this overnight yeah and 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 part of that laggard mentality of not adopting the new um created a situation where y yahoo was having issues I, I i can see that so what was it what was it like to watch i mean to 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 see the dot com bubble coming two years ahead of time and then watching it burst what was that like to 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 recognize that there's going to be a huge problem here mm -hmm. um for the for these oh, different right. companies mm -hmm. it was a nice run I mean, I mean, what else are you going to do, right? Because it, to be honest with you, there wasn't, you know, um, we had a sales conference where our head of worldwide sales a year earlier said the storm's coming. So you knew the storm was coming. You saw the tidal wave out there and there's no way, there was just no way to reverse course. There was no, it just wasn't possible. Um, that being said, you know, the analogy of the tidal wave came over the ship, it didn't sink it. It didn't sink it. Didn't sink Google. Didn't sink Amazon. Right? Um, Facebook came a little a little later, but I mean it didn't even really sink eBay. I mean it didn't sink it. It damaged it.
but it didn't sink. And now it sunk AOL. It sunk pets.com. It sunk, you know, eToys and, you know, all those other drugstore.com. And they were sunk. These other companies weren't. They were damaged. So every company was given that, that didn't sink was given a shot to rebuild. Google and Amazon rebuilt. Um, eBay and Yahoo didn't really rebuild. eBay probably a little more than Yahoo, but not too much more because um, those were the four big companies during the bubble explosion. And is that when you left Yahoo? What, what, what uh, right, 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 yeah, right there. Right, right, at, right in 2000. Yeah, 2000, I think 2001. Um, so, so you know, the the company. Think of the bubble bursting as a Category Five hurricane that came, but you can rebuild after a Category Five hurricane. Communities still do that. Miami was hit with Hurricane Andrew. They rebuilt, right? Um, but for whatever reason, Yahoo made massive mistakes and failed when it had a chance to rebuild because it was not destroyed at that time did you do you i mean looking back on it now do you feel like you left at the right time or do you feel you feel like you, you made the right decision to leave when you did yeah every, the whole first team was ready to leave i mean it wasn't yeah it was the right time and the timing was the timing was right i don't question that gotcha and and if you were to compare those early days that, that you know 25 people um at yahoo versus now you know versus just before the fall what would you say the big comparisons would be well i mean i think be, you mean the fall in 2000 yeah so so if you were to compare the company i mean obviously it grew to i mean how many employees were there when I it mean, when it first 3000 when i left i don't know 3000 I, I i thought it was you know, i mean again i think that it was all good because i thought for the most part, the culture was intact. I think the culture, the culture problem, uh, manifested itself after the bubble burst. I think that is when that's when the whole culture imploded, and you had, you know, you had Yahoo and Silicon Valley fighting with Yahoo in LA. You had, you know, you had Hollywood and Silicon Valley. They didn't get along, you know, at all. You had people running the company that weren't uh, that, you know, barely knew how to turn on their email. I mean, it was a disaster of culture. For, and again, I was left by them, but I've researched this. I did for a book. So the culture was disastrous. That wasn't the case on the first team that was there. We all had a really positive culture. So I would, you know, I wouldn't want to work for a company that's got a distorted culture. Yeah. Where's Yahoo now, based on based on some of your research and, and where everything are set? Well, they? they're owned by Verizon. It's funny they were worth 120 billion dollars, and I think Verizon eventually bought them for four billion. You know, I just read the other day they laid off like 90 of their cafeteria workers, or something along those lines. Um, you know, I think Yahoo today is um, it's one step above Radio Shack and Blockbuster, right? I mean, it still has some decent services. Yahoo people still read Yahoo Sports and news and finance. My wife still has the Yahoo uh, email address. <laughs> uh, and, and I do as well. We're one of the few who have that. But, you know, I think Yahoo email is probably not a, a significant property. But but I do think, you know, news and sports, you know, have a to them and probably have some, some valuation you can attach to it. Um, but beyond that, um, it's I couldn't tell you who runs the company. I couldn't tell you any employee, you know, at the company. Um, they're probably stuck in the basement of Verizon, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 somewhere. Um, probably, I would guess, get very little attention within the Verizon world. Um, I mean, that, and that's a guess, right? I, I don't know for sure, but you know, you don't you don't read about them anymore. You, they're not, you know, they're not in the press. They're not, um, you know, you just don't have, you know. Again, it's it's you read about them if they're almost in a you know, in an, in an obituary sort of way, you know, again, and they're not quite blockbuster, but they're, they're one step above. Right. What are you up to now? Now that you've, I mean, obviously it's been uh, 20 years, 20, 19 well, years. I, you know, I, I get out of, I did some entrepreneurial work, but I, I went into public service. I became a state Senator for 10 years. Um, then I was a democratic nominee for Florida uh, for chief financial officer of the state. I got 4 million votes, but lost the incumbent 51 to 49. Um, so I spent uh, 10 years as an elected and four years as a candidate, I guess. So 14 years of my life was 
focused on politics. I worked in private, did some private equity and venture capital work during that time. Uh, but for 14 years, I focused on politics. Um, and for the past year, I have been focusing on building a, a government procurement business where we help technology companies um, and the state and local uh, um, markets categories. Um, I, you know, I kind of socialize in the, the business, identify opportunities and navigate the process. So is, is it procurement for, I mean, for like PPE um, and, and some of the other things like that? No, well, well, clients like think of, again, a, 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 you know, data cloud company, you know, we have, we have companies that offer transparency websites, accountability websites. So, you know, things like that, things that, that would go to the IT side of government not really focused on the PPE side. Most of that stuff is, um, I don't trust anyway, so. <laughs> so it's a little crazy. It's a little crazy. Yeah. Well, to, to wrap things up here, what advice would you give uh, to other entrepreneurs, whether they be, you know, starting a, a, a software as a service company or just an entrepreneur in general? What, what would be, you know, the, the, the ones that are either just getting started or looking at opportunities like going to work, you know, quitting one day and moving to another job. What, what advice would you give to those individuals? Right. So I think the biggest advice I'd give is entrepreneurs tend to focus on the best technology. Nothing wrong with that. But they don't, the, the go to market side is, a, is, is needs greater focus. That just because you've built a great technology, if you don't have a go to market, aspect behind it you know if you don't understand go to market what's the use of having a great a great technology and you know i'd say the same to a venture capitalist you know they tend to invest only in technologies and they forget there's a go to market you know is mission critical so you know you, you can't just you shouldn't just be a co-founder slash cto right um if you don't have the understanding of how you go to market you're not gonna. You're just not gonna succeed. And I see that all the time. I see great technology that never gets off the ground. Yeah, where where they've they they've done a fantastic job of creating this amazing piece of tech, but they didn't really think through how am I gonna get this in the hands of customers in a scalable way. Yeah, they don't bring the right people on board to do that. You know, I mean, you should. I always tell companies, you know, your most important position is your chief revenue officer. You need to hire that person before, you know, you have to, have, you know, technology. Yeah, yeah, you, there's great technology out there. Um, but just because your technology is great, I don't know, you know, there's still, still a big obstacle to get it to market and, and to sell. Selling is equally as hard as building great technology is. There you go. Selling is equally as hard as building great technologies. And, and I think that, I mean, what you just said echoes back to what you said earlier about the, the mistake Yahoo made in not monetizing search. Um, there, there was so much emphasis, it sounds like, put on the product and building the product and how hard that was that the sales team wasn't able to like open up and say, hey guys, like we're missing an opportunity here. And it, and it was never heard to the point where it actually created. Yeah, it was only, and it was only a hundred billion dollar opportunity. So, oh, is, it, is that all? Just a hundred yeah, billion dollars down the drain. There. Yeah. Interesting. What What do you think? What do you think entrepreneurs could do? Speaking to this advice of of focusing on the revenue and seeing that, what what systems do you think entrepreneurs could put in place to help see some of this move forward um, in in a way that works? Like, what what, what systems could I put in place in my business? to make sure that product never, I mean, cause it has to be, you know, it has to be some, some checks and balances there, right? Well, it, it depends upon the size of the business. You know, I'm a, I've been in small business and big business. You know, I've been in businesses. Yes. You want to operationalize your company in the right way. And you want to have your CRM tools in, 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 in place. You know, you want to have all of your security protocols in place and, and whatnot. And I, and I appreciate that and I understand that at a certain point. I'm a believer that when you start, you're just all hands on deck, balls to the walls, you know, and you build structure as you need to. You don't get, there's no reason to build, you don't want to get ahead of yourself. I've learned that lesson. Mm. You know, don't build a business, don't write a business plan until you have a business. Oh, I love that. Don't 
don't write a business plan until you read a business. I'm going to go. I'm going to send you back. Some of my professors just rolled over in their graves. Um, but but I think you're right. I, I mean, it's really important to understand that, you know, when you have a business, it's about having real customers paying real money and being like, wait a minute. There's an opportunity here. Let's write a business plan around that opportunity that we found. Yeah. I mean, you want to sit there and write a business plan before you start the business, or you want to say, I'm not going public till you know, uh, I have my patents in place, or at least they're protected. You're going to be waiting forever. Go out, you know, and just make it happen. And, and as you grow, you build your structure. And, and I'm not opposed to structure. I think structure is a, is a is a very good thing at a point Mm -hmm. you know don't don't try to mba a company to death especially in a startup i mean i was at you know i mean i was joking with one of my professors at harvard he got a kick out of this you know a few months ago where i said yeah so this is what my harvard mba students remind me of you know there i can show them like some big great financial model and they'll come back he loved this and he'll he'll come back to me and like yeah, but you know, you don't have your five year out on what's going to happen in, in Antarctica. You know, I'm a, you know that that's the Harvard that's the MBA mentality, and so I am very much opposed to over MBAing a company. That is another lesson. Don't I think that is the worst thing you can do is over over analyze. Then you're just getting you're just creating your own obstacles. Mm-hmm. I, I'm all for you at a certain point. All that matters, but not as an entrepreneur. So, what what size of, of a company does it does it merit? You know, bringing in someone who can analyze some of those things for you. Like, where is it? Is it one? Is it two? I mean, obviously not one, but is it fifteen? Is it fifty? Or or, or is there a rough rule of thumb? What, what I don't makes have, you? I don't, I don't have a rough rule of thumb. I don't. I I just think as you grow, you add a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And eventually you've grown and, and you have your systems and your people in place. But the hardest thing to do is to do that without compromising your culture. Because if I'm going a thousand miles an hour and I'm bringing people in who are slowing me down, if I think they're slowing me down, I can look at their them slowing me down and say, okay, they're slowing me down because I really am going too fast. Or they're slowing me down because they're putting useless obstacles. I can appreciate the first. The second is going to kill my culture, you know, and, and, and you have to, you, you can overthink this stuff to death, but you just, you know, you put in a little bit as you go and, and, and it, you know, it, it's okay to, it's okay to start in a little bit of a hyper sort of way. And if you're successful, you can figure all that stuff. You can operationalize your company a lot easier than it is to get started and go sell your product. That's the hardest part. So, so let me just put it different. It's very, it's a lot easier. The hardest thing to do is to light the fuse. It's much easier when the fuse is lit to follow its growth. But lighting the fuse is the hard and don't get caught up lighting the fuse, you know, on some hundred page business plan. Yeah. Figure out how to light the fuse first, then figure out where you need to lay the next, the next pieces of fuse so that it actually continues to grow and then turns into that rocket. Yeah. If Yahoo were in a place where it, it could have taken your advice, this is my final question. If Yahoo were in a place to have taken your advice and to have recognized that it was, and, and hindsight 2020, but let's imagine that they had made the choice to monetize search and to give sales and product a similar amount of power so that so that the company could have continued in that way, do you think that they would have survived the dot-com burst? And do you think that they'd still be the powerhouse that they were They were then? Yes. So let's imagine that the second team did have the right leadership. Where would we be today in terms of Yahoo versus Google? Would, would Google be around or would, would we be in a, in a different what, – what, what would the world look like, I guess? We would be in a much more Burger King, McDonald's. You know, sort of GM Ford like like world, right? Pepsi Coke world. You wouldn't have a monopoly on search. Interesting. I think you would have. Um, I'm not saying Google wouldn't be ahead necessarily, but the biggest mistake Yahoo made early on was not recognizing the power of search. They and wanted they- to be instead of a search engine, they wanted to be a TV network or a large a media. portal. 
yeah. yeah. So, so your your view of it would be that there would then be at least two uh, different individuals uh, who had a, a a hold on the search world. Yeah, I think there could have been. Um, I mean, I, I think that would have been would have been possible. You know, Yahoo, Google was really super smart, but you know. It's like Yahoo was punched in the face, but basically gave them the brass knuckles to punch them with a face with. Mm, mm. Right, here's the brass knuckles, and you can punch me. I mean, I, they didn't really have to do that. Yeah. No, I I agree. I agree. But Jeremy, I I can't thank you enough for joining us on the show. I think your advice of you know don't focus on the rules, don't be afraid to set new rules, don't overanalyze where you are, um, you know, don't over MBA your business to death. I think those are are, are fantastic. Uh, words to live by in terms of, of of creating businesses. Any any last words that you'd like to share uh, with our listeners? And and if uh, no, I appreciate it. I'm I'm good. I appreciate this. I really do. Awesome. If the listeners are are looking to to reach out or get in contact with you uh, to become involved in a business that you're in, what's the what's the best way to reach out? Find me on LinkedIn, Jeremy Wright. Awesome. Okay. Well, Jeremy, again, appreciate your time today on our show and uh, looking forward to having this episode reach our listeners. And that's it today for Automate, Delegate, Eliminate. I'm super excited Jeremy was able to be here with us today and uh, looking forward to bringing more individuals like Jeremy to uh, enlighten your minds with some of the mind-blowing material that he brought to us today. Thanks. You've been listening to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, hosted by Paul Christensen. 